Can I jump in? All right, everybody. It's 6.30. I'd like to get started. We have a pretty hefty agenda today. Before we begin, last week was a little rushed. So for our presenters, our new members, and our appointee in the room, I'd like to do some brief introductions. Can everyone just go around and say their name, class, year, and position on the Senate? We'll start with you, Morgan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Morgan, class of 2016. I'm the Greek Senator, Parliamentarian, and Chair of, community of the Community Relations Committee. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm class of 2016 Senator, and what? I'm Marcus, class of 2016 Senator, and the Chair of the Economic Affairs Committee. Hi, I'm Tina. I'm class of 2015 senator, and I'm vice chair. Uh, my name's Michael. I'm a class of 2016 senator and facilities and services chair. I'm Joe. I'm a 2017 senator. And I chair a committee called the Hospitality Services Advisory Committee. I'm Bobby, 2016 um, senator, treasurer, and facilities and services publicity chair. Paul Elori, 2017. RNE Vice Chair and Chair of Student Rights and Policy in SLC. Something like that. <laughs> um, I'm Melanie. I'm a 2017 Senator and I'm the Chair of Rules and Elections Committee. I'm Lisa. I'm 2015 Senator. I'm Shoshana. I'm a 2016 Senator and I am the Senate Executive Board Liaison and Union Annual Report Chair. Lester Gerhardt, President of the Faculty Senate. Okay, I'll see you directly to the union. Spencer Scott, I'm a graduate senator. I'm Mike Ayla, I'm a graduate senator. I'm Kristen Lee, I'm a graduate senator. I'm Jen Wilcox, graduate senator. James Gambino, grad senator. <laughs> Jenna Friedberg, 2018 senator. Eden Carraway, class of 2018 senator. Justin Etzine, class of 2018 senator. Steve Sparraza, class of 2018 senator. And Lexi Rondoni, class of 2015 senator and student life committee chair. He's Crandall, class of 2015, Senator, Vice Chair of SLC. And I'm Kyle Craig, I'm the Grand Marshal. Gabe in the back there. Hi, Gabe. Hi, uh, my name is Gabe, I'm class of 2016, and I'm Chair of the Web Technologies Group. <coughs> okay, thank you, everybody. So, we have two related speakers today. Um, first, Marcus Flowers is going to be presenting on ongoing projects in the Academic Affairs Committee. And then we have Dr. Gerhardt here to give any updates about the faculty senate. Marcus, are you ready? The moment of truth, will the projector work? Yeah, thank you. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> and uh, as well as a bit about the Faculty Senate. So, next slide. All right, so, academic affairs. The mission that we have this year is to develop and promote support for students' academics careers by putting in place methods for students to be a part of the ongoing changes in their academic environment. In other words, we want students to be able to see their academics not as just something that they go through, but something they can take a part of. You know, realize that it's, it is a give and take between them, the faculty, that faculty are people that they should interact with, and that they're wonderful people, they're there to help, and that if we work together, we can make RPI a better place. Uh, also, part of our project is, uh, or part of our committee's goals this year is to promote the Advising and Learning Assistance Center, ALAC. Uh, it's a very great resource on campus. And we really want to make sure that students are making the best use of it because there are students that do have those issues in classes and struggle. And we want them to know that there are things that they can turn to. And finally, we also want to encourage mentoring between the faculty and the student senate because the faculty senate, they have their, they have their agendas, we have ours, and we know that we can actually make those agendas you know, overlap and coincide. We can work together and we need to make sure that 
they're there to give us guidance and we give them the feedback for the student body as we're expected to do. All right, so some of the current projects that we have going on in the Academic Affairs Committee are uh, ac academic representation, which is the goal of increasing student feedback within departments, and that way when changes are made for departments based on curriculums or different programs that are designed for undergrads, that make sure that those feedback systems are there to make sure that they are going in the right direction and that people are actually getting what they need out of these uh, changes in their departments. Next, we have high-level course mentoring. Now this is a very ALAC intensive project. We're actually looking to um, <clears throat> uh, increase mentoring so that, that way ALAC, which typically covers 1,000, 2,000 level courses, can be expanded further to cover some of the junior and senior level courses that students obviously will have difficulties with because it's a more intense coursework. But because students are leaving after they take those courses, it's hard to keep in place you know, people who they can talk to about these. So by doing this, we can help create an environment where students can actually know who to go to, who to talk to, and hopefully make it so that there are more resources for students beyond uh, the professor and the TA and the textbook. Um, I will talk about the research directory more in a bit. The research archive, however, is slightly different. We have very, very small difference in name for different projects. Uh, this project is geared towards creating a place for students to look and see what research has been done at RPI because we know RPI is very, very research intensive. We have contributed a lot to the world and we want to keep doing that for a very long time. So what the research archive will allow students to do is look and see what's been done here and then they can see who did it and chances are there are people that worked on that that are still at the school so they can go talk to those people, pick up on their work and make sure that we're continuing forward. Now the course syllabi catalog, uh, course syllabus catalog, my apologies. Uh, this is a catalog for students to view some different syllabuses that are on campus before they actually get into the course. Help them guide their course choices. Make sure that when they sign up for a course, they actually are getting into what they expect. They want to learn about a certain subject for an elective. Make sure that they know how to um, what they're signing up for. If there's projects based in the class, they need to know when the projects are coming so in that way they don't end up with four group projects due in the same week. They can hopefully avoid situations like that. And so we're all just a common resource that should be allowed to students and uh, many of the faculty agree. And last is the drop deadline investigation. That's a uh, <clears throat> That's an ongoing look into the drop deadline and seeing if there is something that needs to be addressed there. We're working with the uh, faculty senate on that as well, and we'll uh, talk about that a bit more. next. All right. And an important thing that academic affairs is related to this year is the faculty senate curriculum committee. Now, what this is is a committee for the faculty senate, and they review and modify proposals for courses or curriculum changes. You know, this is the stuff that directly impacts what we're here for. And act there's actually a spot on this committee for students to be a part of. We have one representative uh, from the graduates and two representatives from the undergraduates. Now, there is currently a seat open for undergraduates that I wanted to make known to people. It, uh, they meet on Wednesdays every other week and you actually have a vote at this table. This is where you get to actually express your opinion on if there's a course change being made or if there's a new course being proposed. Does it address the needs of, does it address what the course claims to, the learning outcomes, the, is the professor qualified to teach the class? These are the discussions that come up in this committee. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. And this is just showing uh, where exactly in the process the Faculty Senate Curriculum Committee goes. We have the proposal and goes in the school and then when it finally starts to move outside of the school and be reviewed by people more than just within the related field, that's where the fa we come in, we have undergraduates on the council and graduates, and then the faculty senate again, who we would like to interact with and work with. So in that way, we continue to make sure that there's a dialogue and we can be a better part of the system that's happening at our school. So one of the projects that I wanted to focus on this year is the research directory. That's the word we're using now. So uh, to some point it is, you can, we're looking to create a system where you can go and you can look at what opportunities there are for research on campus. You can look into where your interests lie and see what professors coincide with that. And then if there is an opening in that professor's research area or if they're looking for undergraduates to take on, then naturally you would go with the traditional process of meeting with the professor, talking it over with them, and seeing whether or not you'd be a good fit for the group. 
But what this does is allow students to really have an idea of what's available on campus. And I think that it's a great thing that uh, RPI should have. I'm, and I've actually talked to many faculty members. There seems to be a strong interest. And so I think it's a really good project for students to collaborate with the faculty to put something in place that helps both them and the students. Uh, and as it says here, there are similar uh, establishments in other institutes. And that's pretty much it. Next. All right, so. It's kind of a quick summary of what AAC is doing this year, but what, we're really, what we really want to focus on is the fact that the students aren't isolated from what happens in the school. We're not isolated from the changes that happen for our courses. We're not isolated from the changes that happen in the faculty circle. We have connections with the faculty setting. We want to talk to them. They want to talk to us. We need to make sure that we capitalize on that. We need to make sure that the dialogue is not broken, so in that way, we can make the changes at our school that we would like that benefit everybody. Um, further, we meet Thursdays, 7 to 8 p.m., and I'd love to see you there if you're interested. Are there any questions? Pull over to you. Shoshana? Um, for the research directory, I don't really know how it works. But could you theoretically post research to job link for like openings that students might be interested in? Actually, uh, posting to job link was an idea that was brought up very recently by Paul. And as far as how the system would actually work, we're not quite sure. But we are working on making sure that when we do try to make a pilot for the system, that we do have uh, faculty members that are engaged and willing to commit to you know, the pilot system and making sure that they post and update it. So that way we can get a feel for how the system would work. Uh, but JobLink is looking to be a very reasonable place to integrate this too. Paul? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm the project lead for this committee in AAC. And <coughs> so far what happened is we've talked to Glenn Montes. Glenn Montes, Yeah, in biotech. And right now where we are with the project is we're working on kind of starting a pilot a bit with biotech since um, Glenn has a lot of stuff set or organized so that it would be easy for the three of us working on the project right now. Glenn, um, me, Case, and Varun, a freshman guy who's on the committee, to get started with essentially for now making kind of a catalog or a list that will just say, or we'll reach out to the professors to compile a list of what research is available and what level of student they'd like or any job description they'd have for the job or requirements so that it will, we'll be able to publish the list somewhere and students will be able to access it and over time try to develop it more. So um, Vroom actually was the one who suggested our end product to be kind of a proposal to the school after a semester or two to kind of add a research tab or research thing onto a job link for stuff about for well research eventually as the end goal. So yeah. Lexi. Um you said that um you're planning on trying to increase the ALAC tutoring to higher level courses. Have you thought of a way that you could do that? Because it is I, I understand it is difficult since a lot of the students are graduating that have taken these courses. So have you thought of any alternatives how you could start with that? Uh, actually, yes. I've, I apologize sincerely for, for, for not mentioning the project leads on most of these projects. Actually, uh, Spencer is the lead for that project, and the current system that we're working on is to incorporate uh, the societies that are already within departments. They're an established system, and they're a very helpful resource. So Spencer, would you like to give more information on that? Uh, yeah, so the pilot program we're running right now utilizes uh, the existing American Nuclear Society drop-in tutoring and homework help to um, work with ALAC and expanded services. Um, so right now we're working on expanding to within the main department uh, to get mechanical and aeronautical engineering clubs such as Design Build Fly and uh, hopefully ASME to offer similar services for their respective majors. And the thought is to slowly expand out to School of Engineering and School of Science, et cetera, to see if their professional societies and um, more involved clubs would be willing to offer um, those about an hour of tutoring a week. Is it possible I could follow up, Tom? 
Um, have you thought of maybe expanding this to the graduate students? Like, because graduate students might have taken those higher level courses and, you know, they do have TAs that are paid positions, but I haven't heard of like any tutoring for graduate students to undergrads. So maybe that might be a possibility. Well, as a, as a graduate student, um, that's what a lot of clubs do already. I mean, graduate students or like every other student, they're involved in their clubs. Um, so when you, when you bring the clubs in, you get the upper level students, the lower level students, and the graduate students. So that's, that's pretty much the plan. Justin? Um, so you mentioned a, uh, um, a vacancy for the curriculum committee. If someone were interested uh, in applying, how would they go about doing so? Thank you. Joshua? You mentioned uh, an investigation into the drop deadline. What exactly are you looking into here? Is it too early, is it too late? Is this a general look into it? What are you trying to accomplish with that? Right now, it is more of a general look into it because there has been concern expressed about it. And before we make any you know, jump, jump to any conclusions, we want to actually figure out all the information that we need. And so that way, we're collaborating with the Faculty Senate to address this issue, and so then that way we can see if we do want to pursue it, which way we want to pursue it. Is it, and further, if it's whether or not it's the deadline itself, or whether or not it's just certain courses that are conflicting with the deadline. Do you know what concern has been brought to your attention about the deadline, specifically? Um, right now, the primary concern that I've heard is that sometimes it's hard for students to have a, day, a good idea of where they stand before the deadline comes. And so it's hard to make a decision whether or not to drop a course if you only know 10% of your grade at that time. Yeah. Okay. Tina? Um, I was just going to say a comment on the tutoring for higher level classes. You mentioned professional societies. Did you look into like the honor societies like Tally Pi and Pi Tau Sigma? Mm -hmm. I, that's kind of assumed, but in some of the club, it's some of the majors we looked at, they're just not involved, and that's why the professional societies and other clubs have, have had higher enrollment or whatever. <coughs> Kyle? Um, I, my question is more directed towards the research project. Now, um, I guess this is kind of for the floor, but for students in here who have had research. On point of order, which of the two research projects? Um, the research directory. Thank you, Paul. But um, for students in here who have had research in their time at RPI, I guess what are the primary means you've used to find those opportunities? Lexi? Um, from my experience, I think just going to professors and having an idea of what their research is and telling them your career goals, I know is something that works because sometimes, you know, students will just be like, oh, I want research for a resume, but like, I think, but it's helped for me, you know, showing them that you're really interested. So maybe in a research directory, like having a better explanation of the current projects and maybe what graduate students need help because... Kristen is an example of a graduate student that often needs help from undergrads. Uh, that might help. You know, maybe search out some graduate students along with professors, because maybe Kristen might be able to add to that. But Kristen? Um, so I think in some situations, <coughs> I'm mainly my experience, um, professors actually go to their graduate students and see what graduate students uh, need help as far as developing projects and how many hands they could, I guess, uh, handle for undergrads. So, um, one way of tackling it is maybe talk to Glenn and see if you can also directly go to the graduate students and see if they're willing to write project descriptions um, in addition to their professors. That is actually something that, uh, that is actually one of the ways that we're planning on going about it is because in my initial meeting with Dr. Linhart during the summer, the, one of the main things they point out was that you have to make sure that the professor is willing to take on the undergraduate. They have an undergrad, they have a grad student available, and then a grad student that's also willing to teach X number of students. Melanie, um, going off like Kyle's question about how um, to get undergrads involved, what happened? Um, I know in my story at least, we get like emails from grad students um, saying like, oh, like we need. Um, undergrad like chemical engineers or like you know bi biology majors and so I know that's like that's a good way that we do it like, you know, other, like I don't know if IFC does that but I know PNL does. The queue is open. 
Anyone else have questions for Marcus? Dr. Gilmore? Yeah, I, not a question as much as a, a comment to, to enhance what you said. Uh, there are a variety of sites uh, which list the faculty in various departments under the departmental site, which indicates what their uh, research interests are in general and sometimes very specifically. There's also uh, the URP site, the Undergraduate Research Program, campus-wide, uh, which lists many of the faculty and, again, their research interests and maybe in a more active sense of what they're doing at the moment and where they may need student support. So rather than start you know, from ground zero, certainly I would say look at those and build upon those. You could do a lot by integrating those and modifying them in a particular way, regrouping them, uh, editing, and so on, uh, some existing sites. Use that at least as a basis to, to move ahead. Paul? Um, so um, with what you said, Dr. Gerhardt, um, where we had from my conversation with Dr. Monasterski, um, where we had started working was using the biotech and integrated studies website to get the what, or he kind of filtered through that since he knows the department uh, to say which professors were accepting undergrads and which professors either weren't there yet or weren't, just don't accept undergraduates regularly and kind of the plan he, or guide he gave us, which we think would probably work for most other departments, would to be working with somebody like him to kind of use that list and filter it out. And then e when we have our <coughs> list, emailing the different professors individually, which is the next step that we're gonna be taking over the next right. week. I agree. And just keep in mind to respond that <clears throat> I mentioned the departments, but I would say most of the research in today's world is highly interdisciplinary. Uh, so it usually involves many different disciplines. Uh, regardless if you may think it's electrical or, or civil or uh, chemistry or whatever it happens to be. Uh, it involves uh, people undergrad and grad in a mixed sense, but also from different departments. So please keep that in mind. Don't try to isolate one department from the other and compartmentalize uh, to, to too much of an extreme. You know, be flexible. Lexi? Um, Paul's done a good job at covering some of this stuff. Kyle? My question's directed to Dr. Gerhardt. Um, as, of course, research is a very individualized field. Every professor needs something different. Um, every professor has their own project they may be working on, or departments in some cases. Um, what do you feel, do, what, I guess, what challenges do you feel we should be aware of appro approaching this proposition to kind of get it off the ground? Well, I, I've been trying to understand what challenges individually or in this <coughs> sense barriers to establishing um, what this committee is looking to establish? Well, I think the, the issue of doing research becomes very much an individual issue on the part of the person. I think people have mentioned this before. Uh, you seek out professors uh, within a discipline or particularly an interdisciplinary group and go to visit those people, chat with them, <clears throat> understand what the nature of the problems are that they face and try to bring your competencies meet, meet some match uh, with what the people are doing and establish a bit of a, a rapport. I'm uh, very strongly in support of a face-to-face -face type of communications <clears throat> in that regard. Uh, so I think one has to explore that, explore the avenues and sort of learn by doing. Uh, it's not, there's not a direct prescription step-by-step step of exactly what to do. I think that research, doing research, is an extremely valuable dimension uh, of what a person should do even as an undergraduate. Uh, <clears throat> I won't say regardless, but depending on the degree aspirations, bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, uh, some people feel, uh, and I think it's somewhat erroneous, the only people who are looking to do research are oriented towards a PhD. That's, that's certainly not the case. I think research is a valuable dimension of learning and, and very heavily integrated with classroom learning in, in a course, for example. And I think that one should try to seek out uh, all opportunities uh, by meeting with individual faculty and get on board with a research team 
of graduate students and undergraduates as well to get to understand what research is about and how it is best to conduct that research. You know, be that theory, analysis, simulation, or all of the above in a variety of fields and understand better for a particular area that of work what the interdisciplinarity uh, scene is, how various people from various disciplines have to be brought together, work together towards a common goal. I think it's a wonderful educational experience. And you should try uh, all avenues to get something, not for the sake of how it looks on the resume. Yes, that too is important. I don't deny that. But it isn't what it says on the resume. It, it, what, it's the way it is with you as a person. And that becomes very apparent, I won't say even transparent, to an interviewer who's considering hiring you, you know, as you graduate. It, it, it shows, so to speak, the value of research, the value of a strong education, of good grades, all the different pieces fit together. And I would just be encouraging for all undergraduates, much like the URP, the Undergraduate Research Program, encourages, if one could do it, all undergraduates to do some uh, level, some dimension of research. Thank you. The queue is open. OK. Anyone else? Thank you, Marcus, for the presentation. Now, as this is our first GBM of the month, of course, we've given a slot on the agenda to Dr. Gerhardt for the Faculty Senate. Do you have anything you would like to present or share with us today? Uh, just briefly, I would underscore uh, Marcus's presentation of cooperation with the Faculty Senate. We have arranged with, with your president and myself to have exchange visits uh, between myself, Kyle, whoever the representative happens to be uh, relevant to the discussion uh, with the Faculty Senate and with the Student Senate, hence my presence here. So please understand that the lines of communication are open. We're, we're there to help. Uh, as I view, you're, the, you're here to help, and we can, any advice or counsel we can give you, uh, please feel free to establish that contact. So I think that's the biggest message I could, I could put forth at this time. Uh, Marcus has mentioned the list of the items at the beginning. Uh, we have met, that is Marcus and I, Kyle, a few others have met uh, over the course of the last year to year and a half discussing these various issues. I'm glad to see they front and center. Uh, I think it would do well to prioritize some of these, which are most important. It's a big undertaking to do any one of these projects. I would suggest that you look at a handful, the one, two, or three of them, and, and do it very, very well, and realize you know, your objective. In terms of what was mentioned, the, the uh, issue of the drop deadline, uh, I think you really should not look at that as a, as a problem, but look at it to discover, is there really an issue or not? Uh, and I suggested that to, to Kyle and to Marcus. I think the Student Senate <clears throat> would do well to look at a, a bit of a survey, official or, or otherwise, garnering input from a variety of students and see if there are these conflicts. The conflict that was raised is, is clear when it exists, and that is the coincidence or when the second exam in many cases occurs with respect to the drop deadline. The drop deadline this semester is October 17th, about the eighth week through the semester. And what uh, is presented, what Marcus presented, is if there are two exams for the sake of argument, hypothetically, and the final, uh, the student may have only one examination uh, at that point of the job. Perhaps you would like two examinations. I don't believe that the syllabus that most of us as faculty make up uh, is, is done in any adversary way to see if we can just fit this other exam in you know, at a certain time right after the drop dead. I mean, it's, you know, certainly no one really does that. Uh, but if, is there really an issue or not? And how many courses does that really occur? This is probably easily uh, settled on a case-by-case -case basis. So I would say keep that in mind. Don't make a generic issue out of some, something that could just be resolved by, by talking with the professor, or if we want to bring it up in general, find out first to what extent it is, it is an issue. I mean, I would be confident if it really is presented that way, and uh, 
the statistics are given and this really is uh, significant, uh, maybe we should then orient <coughs> that and present that to the faculty uh, in a way to consider, as you make up a syllabus, uh, what the drop deadline is and consider a second exam in that context. I mean, how many courses have two exams? How many have exams? How many have finals, et cetera? What about homeworks? So just, just do a little investigation to bring it up as uh, if it really is an issue or just could be settled case by case. We could certainly help to implement that uh, in any case to you know, make it easier. But please understand that I, I believe the, to underscore this, the communications to me is very important. Uh, we, we've got that. The cooperation is implicit and explicit. You know, please take advantage of it. Uh, and realize we're all working in a cooperative environment. You know, some of us teach and others learn. And sometimes it works the other way as well. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone have any last questions for Dr. Gerhardt? All right. Yes. Lexi. Um, are there any like specific projects the Faculty Senate is working on right now that hasn't been mentioned in the meeting? Oh yeah, there, there are several that uh, Marcus did the cover. We were covering what's uh, the projects that are being worked on from the student senate point of view and academic. Uh, we certainly have, uh, I mentioned the last time as well, four standing committees. The curriculum committee is one, promotion and tenure is another, uh, planning and resources another, and honors and awards is the fourth one. Those are standing committees of the faculty senate. Uh, the curriculum committee is the one that Marcus mentioned that is very involved uh, certainly with the courses, new courses, courses to be deleted, etc. And uh, processes a relatively large number of courses each year, proposals coming from the faculty, uh, perhaps special topics courses that now evolve to be standing courses in the catalog, have to pass the scrutiny of the curriculum committee, the faculty senate, and of course on up the chain as well. Uh, so there's a lot of commonality of interest of topics. We're uh, very involved now uh, with issues dealing with advising, very much like what Marcus mentioned. And we're looking at having workshops, as we do for faculty, uh, both undergraduate and graduate advising, and for both new and uh, existing faculty as well. And so we've uh, reached a common ground in that regard, and we're pursuing that to uh, create workshops uh, for faculty on a regular basis to make them available to faculty, all in support of just what you're talking about, mentorship, advising, and so on. Joshua? Professor, I'm curious. I've taken a number of different words. Professors use a variety of different methods of reporting grades. Many use LMS. Many use their own system. Many don't use any sort of digital uh, system of any kind. In, especially in respect to the drop deadline, in certain courses, it can be very hard to analyze well where you stand when you may only have paper uh, copies back with numbers on them. And depending on the syllabus, it may be quite simple to calculate where you are. Others, depending on if there's a curve at the end of the semester, it can be quite challenging. Is there an opinion uh, of yours or the fact in terms of whether professors should be using a digital system of some kind to keep track that we can access or whether it's fine to just use nothing? Well, at the moment, we have implemented digital measures. You're probably familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And that includes a variety of subcomponents in digital measures and does include what the nature of the course and how the grading is brought about. Uh, so I think there is a common basis where that is readily available. And faculty uh, are, are asked to use that. And I think most do use it. Uh, certainly, and it has all that information available. Uh, I mean, I personally, I will only speak for myself, but I know many of my colleagues uh, certainly issue a syllabus. Uh, it, it's available uh, through digital measures. It's available on the web. Uh, I just give it out to the students, and being a paper type person as well, I make hard copies for everybody as well. And the grading is, is there for anybody to look at. Uh, and how much uh, the, the homework count, the home, uh, examinations, final project options, etc. cetera. I, I think it's uh, readily, rel relatively coalesced, I would say, relatively coalesced uh, into a common structure under digital measures. I don't think that's a, really a particularly difficulty. I think students are in a good position to, uh, and there's also a mid-semester evaluation 
I think most professors do as well. So if the student is not doing well, uh, the student really should know that. There are various, I, I mean, I would not make light of this. There's a great degree of feed, uh, feedback in each of the courses, not just the midterm evaluation, but the early warning system is another example where if you're not doing well, you, you get a note from ALAC. So. Justin. Um, uh, hello, President. Uh, first, <coughs> Were you on the last list next? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, um, Professor, um, I've only taken five classes at RPI so far because I'm a first semester freshman. Um, sadly, only 40% of my five classes, so two of them, have um, implemented any form of online grade tracking. Um, for the other three, it's been basically you need to keep track of it on your own um, via just based on what's given to it back to us um, in terms of graded materials. And some of these, uh, some of these classes have interesting grading scales and what, we're, what I'm not really accustomed to coming from straight out of high school. Um, what do you rec um, do? You have any sort of recommendation in that? How can we? How we? We should um, could keep track of these grades a little bit more efficiently. Or um, is there any? Do you have any? Is there any plans for um, standardizing how teachers distribute their grades? Because then maybe there would be a more um, there would be a better layout of where we can see and how we can keep track of how we're doing. Because um, otherwise, it, it's it's a little difficult to take your tests and then put it through the grading scale and then get out a number and then try and you know numerically decide where you stand in the class. At least on, on my on my for at least for myself, it's been it's been the challenge. Well, I hear what you're saying, and I, I would suggest that uh, most directly you speak to the professor in the course uh, and try to resolve it that way. Again, I'm, I've been here for, for quite a while and taught a whole variety of courses, and I, I know how I do it, and I thought I knew how most of my colleagues do it. Digital measures you know, does exist and is, I think, somewhat universally used uh, here at Rensselaer as, as well as elsewhere. There is the midterm evaluation. There is the early warning system. I know it's repetitive, but uh, pretty much everyone I know uses that. So I've, I've been under the impression that the feedback to the student, based on my own experiences, is rather direct, is kept current. Uh, I, have, I run an LMS site, you know, for the course. You, you, you can just, you know, look that up, uh, you know, at any time, uh, and have access to page through LMS. So we do all of it. If anything, I would say that there's a good deal of redundancy, different methods by which you can constantly check on your on your progress and also be notified if you're not you know meeting up to uh, where where the level is by virtue of the early warning system as well Shoshana um just a friendly reminder to students um, the evaluations went out um, the midterms ones are kind of general because you do the radial button scale of your professors on certain dimensions but really take time to fill out the <coughs> comment section. Um, it sounds kind of stupid, like who's going to read this? Um, some professors really do care. Um, some will even give you extra credit for filling it out. I remember one professor, I wrote a comment saying that he tended to use small font and really bad color schemes on his presentations and they were hard to follow, and then he changed them. So um, if, you, if you're specific and you're clear, I think professors really take it to heart. Um, to reply to Justin a little bit, um, it, I can't speak for all RAs or LAs, um, but a lot of the upperclassmen in general have really good tips and tricks and tools that they've made for themselves to track grades and academic progress. Um, I remember specifically one of my RAs showed me this academic planner he made on Excel, which basically, because that formula is already defined on our institute systems, you can calculate in Excel, say, say I have an A in this grade worth this many credits, you can calculate out your GPA for infinity, basically. Um, and so little things like that. Um, the, the, the professors are a great resource, but also ask uh, other students who have taken the class or who have made tools of themselves, because um, I find that if there's something I want to make, someone else has probably made it before me. Okay. The queue is open. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much for coming. Okay, so we have three motions on the table for tonight. Um, so without further ado, 
motion number one, the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate approves the formation of the Constitution Committee, effective immediately. So moved by Steve Sparaza, seconded by Joe Venusto. Nathan James, one of our guests, can act as a speaker for this motion for the sake of the queue. Queue's now open. Oh, Paul. Um, as I've stated before, to probably highlight some other members of the Senate, I just think it's not a good idea to have a third running Constitution Revisions Committee for the third academic year in a row, simply because if it's just like every year the Senate comes and says, hey, we're going to revise the Constitution. Hey, we're going to revise the Constitution again. Guess what we're doing again? We're revising the Constitution. It just makes it seem like we don't know what we're doing or it's overkill and people will just chime it out or ignore it or be like uh, they're just at this again with something doing whatever especially with the whole ruckus of how it ended not well at all with a gigantic mess last year i think it's just time to give it a rest for a while because the wording in the constitution for the most part the changes last year were just changing the wording to be how things work to be accurate how things work day to day now so it's not like it really changes the practicalities of anything or something or the day-to-day -day workings. So I think it's just time to give it a rest for a year or two. Mike? Um, yeah, we did not rise last year. This didn't happen, right? As if, like, I mean the... Process of it? Okay. The process um, of it. Try to get the back and forth. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we rise last year, and there were some good changes. And even though they just affected um, we're like what we're doing now, um, and they don't mean as much as you say. Um, I don't see why they can't do it then. Because there's stuff in the Constitution that we're, we're not using now. And we want to worry so it works the way we do it right now. It makes sense to update it at least. Um, Shoshana? Um, this is a very specific example, and I have no quantitative measures to back <laughs> it up. But as we all know, when you're running for student government, you have to pulse it. I will uh, recall from my personal experience when I pulsed that last year and the Constitution changes came up, um, a particular strong population of Greek students um, came up and said, uh, I see that you're eliminating IFC and Panhel from the Constitution, why? And then from my knowledge, I explained to them, um, and, and they said that, that, w that I wish that that was a separate amendment so that I could vote on it because I agree with this point, but I don't agree with the whole thing. I think the process was wrong, whether it should be a committee and address a whole lot of changes or it should be one specific change proposed by a very specific group of students. I'm really in favor of a specific group driving a specific amendment, and I know IFC and Penhall last year drove that specific amendment. I don't know if they're still going to do it. I don't know if it's going to pass or not. I don't know any of that information. I'm just saying a very specific example that I saw in my experience. Joshua? To follow up on Joshua, I would definitely agree that with any amendment being made, the amendment should be specific and should be voted on separately. Uh, when you combine a whole bunch of different ideas together, you run into the issue of someone might agree with, disagree with one of the five I think being changed, and therefore the entire uh, amendment system then uh, doesn't get passed like what I believe happened last year. So I would definitely say that anything should be, all, all the amendments should be separately voted on. You can make sure that each one has its own opinion and not the combination. Michael? Um, so I guess first, that part we can, they can probably go over during Constitution Committee, assuming this gets passed, but I, I would say I disagree with Paul just because I don't think we've made the committee with the mindset that the Constitution sucks, like we need to revise it. It's an evaluation of the Constitution. Where would changes might, where where do you think we might need to make changes? And if so, like how do we change that? Not, we're looking to rehaul the whole thing every single year. And because of that, um, people, people go through this school every four years, and it's important to keep like looking at it with different eyes, like because the people that go through this, like people that were working, working on it last year aren't gonna be on the committee this year. There's going to be new people on the committee this year, so I think it's important that we make it. Justin? Um, following up to that, um, it would make sense that even if there were two advi uh, advisory committees in the previous years, it would make sense that the work done in those committees would carry over into this committee. It wouldn't necessarily, I, I don't think it would be, it would start all over back to square one. So um, it wouldn't be redundant. It would be more, would be more of a continuation of the previous work that was being done. Jacob? Uh, I guess just to answer Jeff's question, 
I would, the IFC was largely very happy with all of the constitution changes regarding the IFC and to my own <coughs> panel was too. So I would be very surprised if a scenario would exist where they wouldn't wish for those same changes in the future. Mike? Um, either way we do it, like the committee wise or a, a single a push for certain single amendments, I think we need more transparency in this one committee. Because last year there was a lot of misinformation pushed around and that led to some other debates and posters. Um, the point in forming a committee, to my understanding, is more to look at the Constitution in one way or another. That is the purpose of this committee, to review and update the Union Constitution. How that is done is going to be up to the committee's chair and to the people who are on that committee. So all of these methods are perfectly viable, and by joining this committee you can have a say in how that's approached. The queue is open. Lexi? How about, Nathan, do you have any specific plans that you'd like to tell us about what you want to do with the committee? Clarify some questions. Well, um, I guess there's two things here. One is forming the committee. Second is who you're appointing as chair. So if you think the committee needs to be formed, that should be decided first. Secondly, I think just honestly, from my point of view, some things just need to be updated about the Constitution. I don't think you can have a document that you say governs the way um, RPI, the union is run, that we don't follow in certain ways. It doesn't reflect how it actually is. What's the point of the document if you don't accurately reflect the way it's written? So if the independent council is in the document, but they voted to disband themselves. Um, I have seen Panhel would like to have their own separate, would like to be separate. I know the judicial board has some changes they would like to make. Class councils don't exist as part of the constitution. So from those points of view, those are changes I would like to see made. Um, in terms of transparency, um, that's something that would be very big for this committee. Um, I think the students need to know. I think you go change by change. I agree with that, that it's an amendment by amendment, because um, there are some things that just, uh, I, I agree that you can agree with one part of it and not all the others. So from that point of view, I agree with you that it should be amendment by amendment. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. All right, the queue is now open. All right, any further comments? Seeing none, then we'll move to vote. Once again, I'll reread the motion. The Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate approves the formation of the Constitution Committee, effective immediately. So moved by Stephen, seconded by Joe. All those in favor? Can you guys raise them high, please? All opposed? It's going to be 19 1 2. All right, motion passes 19 1 2. Claps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our second motion, and uh, we leaked into this one a little bit in the last conversation, but the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate confirms the Grand Marshal's appointment of Nathan James to the position of Constitution Committee Chair, effective immediately. So moved by Morgan and seconded by Marcus. Nathan, would you like to say a few things? Um, I think I pretty much said my position on this. Um, if you have questions. Okay, the queue is now open. Michael? Uh, what is your experience with the Constitution, or anything um, my experience with the Constitution is I'm a member of the Judicial Board. Um, I'm an alternate member, so from that point of view, I tracked some of the changes last semester. I worked closely with Kyle. But honestly, from this point of view, I like that I'm an outsider for how last year's was run. <coughs> so I don't want to see some of the changes, uh, some of the mistakes that were made last semester. I'd like to see them change. Mike? Did you send the committee last year? I did not. The queue is open. Shoshana? Sometimes the Judicial Board uh, reviews various documents, such as the Constitution. If this Constitution Committee looks at the Constitution, then there was a problem with the Constitution, then the J Board reviewed the Constitution, would you excuse yourself from reviewing the Constitution? I would say yes to that, actually. The queue um, is open? I would just like to say, I'm an ultimate member on the J Board, so I sit on cases if necessary, but I probably would not sit on it. The queue is open. 
update. Well, I'm just curious as, as to what else, if anything else, you intend to change <coughs> other than what you've already mentioned regarding class councils and um, other things not existing in the eyes of the Constitution. Those are the major things I see right now. Um, I would like to take the opinion of other members of the committee, things that come up. Um, I don't have a other other things I don't have right now in mind, but I'd like to listen to what other people have to say. Justin. Yeah, go, go, he, he raises his hand first. Oh, go Michael. Oh, I thought Kyle would. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you didn't you didn't serve on a committee. I, I'm assuming that might be like Senate committee or something. Do you have any experience like leading a committee, being a part of like committees? Um, yes. I was I guess I have a long history of being on various decision making bodies. Starting in high school, I was really for like team captain and like our community chair. I was on student council and treasurer. I was treasurer in my fraternity last semester. I'm vice president and house manager of my fraternity right now. Um, so I've done a lot of work with that. Justin? Um, these amendments, or if, if amendments are made to the Constitution, um, before they're sent out to the student body, would we be able to uh, vote on them ourselves, like in, inside, the, inside the Senate? Would you would you send them to as the a point of info? We have to. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Kyle. <coughs> yeah. So um, you mentioned a few changes you're interested in making to Lexi during the earlier conversation. How did you arrive at those items as necessary changes? Um, I don't know. I guess for me, one of the things for the independent council I look at is. Uh, I was actually elected independent council and it was disbanded because uh, I'm actually a member of Greek before I was able to join. But uh, so from that point of view, I look at that as kind of being why is that? Um, and then as I read over the document for when I was joining the judicial board, I was wondering why, why class councils aren't on there. Um, and even more than that, I looked at the amendments last year when we were voting on them and I thought most of them made sense. So. I look at it from past history and just other student opinions I've heard and conversations I've had with Kyle. Joshua? You mentioned uh, a want for increased transparency, specifically in regard to what happened last year. Do you have any specific ideas on how to get uh, students in general outside of the, the Senate involved in this committee, how to make sure they're aware of the changes and get their opinions, regardless of whether or not they're actually sitting on the committee? Um, a big one for me is Reddit, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm happy to post. People will know that it's me. I'd like to have regular discussions with the Polytechnics so they know exactly what we're doing, so they should be able to know from that. Um, and honestly, my information is happy to go to people. They can always contact me, um, email. So I'm happy to put my information out there. So those are really the ways I look at it. Okay. Melanie? Um, how are you do, like selecting your members of the committee? Like, is there already a committee that exists, or do you are you picking people, or how does it work? Um, there is not already a committee formed. We have to form that. I would see it. Um, I don't actually know for sure how we'd end up doing that. I would see it as various groups. Most of the groups on campus should have one, especially student government. Executive board, oh, that was, I'm sorry, just to answer a previous question. Another thing is the executive board stated before they'd like to increase their membership, so that was something else I'd like to see probably happen. So executive board, judicial board members, I'd like to see members of the Senate, um, the class councils, undergraduate council, graduate council, I'd like to see members from those points of view. I'd also like to see members of PANHEL and IFC on the board. Um, I don't know for sure how they'd be chosen. I'm guessing they would be appointed and confirmed by the Senate. Um, so, and in general, I'd like to be open to the student body, all the meetings, I'd like to be able to see and know what we're doing. I also see, for transparency, open forums for students to discuss what we're doing. Okay. Uh, Keegan? My concern has been addressed. Okay. Thank you. Paul? Uh, just as an overview, because it kind of got skipped over, though, Kyle kind of highlighted a bit for the freshmen. Um, when there's something like constitutional amendments to the union, what happened is uh, something like the committee, the Constitution Committee, or anybody can suggest them to the Senate, and the Senate would vote on whether or not to add them to a school wide referendum. And if we vote yes, it will be added to the list of things to vote on during the school wide elections during GM week. Okay, Shoshana? 
Um, what would be the process you're looking at for these amendments? Would the committee create the amendment and then go back to the body and say, you know, can you review this? Or would you ask the body to create the amendment and then the Constitution Committee review it? I would see it as more the first way, actually. I think that we'd have variety meetings throughout the week. We'd probably address an issue at a time, come up with a well-defined proposal, what we expect, and then ask the general body to review it, see what their changes, and then we can change it the next week again. But I would like to have a proposal to put forth before the Senate. We find each, uh, each member. The queue is open. Any further questions? Oh, Jacob. So what would you do, Nate, to ensure that like the groups that each of the uh, you know, amendments affect have sufficient input? Because I know one of the problems that happened last year was that, especially from like the IFC Panhel perspective, you know, the committee was doing this and for most of the time that like, you know, it was happening, like we had no idea that the process was even really occurring until like a week or two before the actual Senate vote. And I, I guess that's pretty problematic. <laughs> Well, I guess I've answered that in some way, shape, or form. I think we're going to be transparent. I think people will know. And I also think we'd like members from each of the bodies to be on the committee. Um, and any time we're discussing an amendment involving the committee, uh, involving a branch of government or some body, then that group would be informed well in advance. Shoshana? I worked on the Constitution Committee last year. It's my personal belief that unless the amendment comes directly from the group, then that amendment should not be considered because the group did not have the say. The queue is open. Um, so since I'm the rules and elections chair, um, and so there is, okay, so 7B1 in the Senate bylaws, says the committee shall be responsible for reviewing and approving the language of all constitutional amendments that come before uh, the Senate for approval. This didn't happen last year, and so when we were putting the amendments on the ballot, we um, there was like kind of a lot of issues with that. Um, we didn't really know like what was like what we were supposed to put on it because there was no like there's no communication with rules and elections like when we were like making this. Oh. So. As a point of order, seven or clause seven in the bylaws is the rules and elections committee clause. So the phrasing in seven B one referring to the committee is the rules and elections committee. The queue is open. <coughs> Wait, what? Uh, I was gonna. Oh, no. th sorry. <laughs> um, okay. So, so for the um, like. I just want to make sure that there's like some kind of communication with rules and elections too. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. I guess I'm going to say yes. I'm not okay. <laughs> um, I see myself going to all cabinet meetings for the Senate. I'll probably okay. end up at most Senate meetings. Um, so you can always ask me questions, and all all um, language will be approved by the Senate. So I know. So. That's my answer. The queue is open. Do we have any further questions? Any other comments for Nathan? Okay, then, seeing none, we'll move to vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Raise them high, please. Okay. Just one. Motion passes sixteen one five. All right. We have one final motion for the evening. Um, the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate confirms the Grand Marshal's appointment of Jennifer Wilcox, graduate, to the position of Student Government Communications Chair, effective immediately. So moved by Justin, seconded by Keegan. Jen, would you like to speak? Sure. Um, so I'm a graduate senator here. I really, uh, I'm really excited to chair the Communications Committee. 
Um, that was the original committee I really wanted to serve on, uh, especially to help improve transparency between student government and the student body, um, especially with regards to a lot of the projects we have going on now. Um, I have some experience with this, mainly with the Graduate Student Council, specifically the School of Science Grad Council, um, since I've co-chaired that. So I'm um, just really excited. Uh, we got a social media campaign I'm hoping to start, um, and I'm looking forward to meet, meeting with the public chairs and any interested members of the committee. The queue is now open. Michael. Um, so I was wondering how much you knew about like how we did like publicity in the past, like last year and the year before, and how we were looking to improve on that specifically. Um, so since I wasn't quite involved uh, last year, I took some time to kind of look into the different uh, electronic ways that the student government has to communicate with the student body. I know we have Twitter that I don't think has ever been used. Um, there's a Facebook page. Um, and obviously Reddit's going to be you know, a good tool to communicate major projects um, to the student body. I also wanted to see, um, obviously this is gonna be a little different, um, but I think we should have Facebook pages for the committees for them to do you know, little updates and then like consolidate the major updates to the student government page. Um, Lexi? Um, given that we're already halfway through this semester, how do you plan about starting with the communications committee um, and engaging the publicity chairs since committees have kind of been let loose on some of our stuff already? All right, so like I said, I thought it would be a good idea for each of the committees um, to have their own Facebook page because I think that would be kind of an integral uh, component for each committee, especially for reaching out to students interested in that specific um, committee itself and the specific projects they're interested in. So I think those can be run by the publicity chairs themselves. Um, obviously, we have to have some discussion with this uh, at the, our first meeting. Um, as for, I guess, were you asking about membership in general as well? Um, that I'm gonna do an open call for um, using Reddit and the student government Facebook. Um, I'm not sure if the website is up and running yet because it was down last time I checked. Um, but just really any way we can reach out to the student population um, that's easily accessible for them. Justin. Um, I have two questions I know I need to address them to you. Um, the first question is, is um, considering the hyperspeed um, introduction and dilapidation of social networks and um, how quickly they're changing and, um, and how people are using them differently on a, on a, almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, how do you um, plan to keep people um, interactive with the committees on, on social media and how do you look to um, implement new, new social medias and new technologies into how we communicate with um, the students? Because I know that um, as time passes, less and less people are checking Facebook pages. Right, right. Um, so that's where I think uh, Reddit can play a big role, but also um, tabling. I was thinking like not necessarily just resorting to um, social media, especially because it's so volatile. Um, sometimes people just don't pay attention to it because there are so many you know, new Facebook pages popping up. They just flood your news feed. They can kind of get messy. But um, also, uh, just being open as a chair, if anyone's interested in it. Um, also, I wanted to make use, I know we have a student government uh, bulletin board. Um, so, I mean, it's not gonna reach everybody, but I think um, it would be a good way you know, to get started. And the second question of the two is, um, actually, I was don't remember it. So, I guess that's exactly what you Thank you. Michael? Um, so I know working with the previous graduate senators that they're super busy mm -hmm. and like, um, yeah, so I was wondering like how, <laughs> how busy do you anticipate being <laughs> this coming year and like how much time do you plan on like, devoting to being the committee chair? Okay, well, um, I'm a third year, I've been through my candidacy, so that is kind of a huge event um, for students, so that's something 
Um, that pretty much took all my time up until now. Now I have pretty much a set experiment schedule um, with the type of work I do. It doesn't really vary too much. Um, so I kind I know I have the time to commit to this, I guess, if that's what you're asking. Um, and a lot of the work I do kind of results, uh, you know, I have to wait a while to, to get my results and things. So I have a lot of time where um, I have my own office, I'm at my computer, I'm checking emails, you know, I'm always connected pretty much. So I think I'll be able to, you know, address any issues, concerns, um, not immediately, but pretty soon when they, when they pop up. So you mentioned doing things that are not on social media. I really remember in my, in my freshman year, the mm -hmm. Senate would go out and just sort of stand out by Russell Sage Dining Hall and talk to people. Any any thoughts of sort of just getting people out there on a regular basis where students can know, mm -hmm. hey, look, the Senate's there and I can go talk to them? Yeah, yeah. I was actually interested in that. At my undergrad, that was actually like a huge deal. Um, it obviously was a different campus. I went to UMass Amherst, so it's, it's a very different dynamic than here at RPI. Um, but there was a lot of tabling, basically, you know, dining halls, uh, student union, places where there's a lot of student activity, a lot of students walking around, um, just having, you know, like bulletins like, this is what student government's up to, do you want to talk about student government, you know, obviously this will involve some cooperation from senators and any, any interested students who want to join the committee, but that, that's a part of the, what I want to do. Okay, the queue is open. Joshua? Uh, a follow-up. Um, I don't remember exactly what school. One of the schools I visited, uh, the student senate had a time set aside, I don't remember if it was the beginning or the end of every senate meeting, specifically set aside for students to just come in without any sort of appointment, schedule anything, and have a couple minutes to address concerns to the senate. This is obviously more broad than just the communications committee. Mm -hmm. But any thought on just a lot, having a ability for students to just come in and address the senate on a generic issue without having something specific they want to bring up? Um, I mean, I think if someone's really passionate about an issue, they can always run it by communications. And if, you know, we decide that um, it's, you know, something that they really want to present to the Senate, they can. I mean, these meetings are always open, especially if, you know, people really want to bring something up to the Senate. So, I mean, I think students have access to the Senate if, if they want to use it. So. Um, just to follow up on that, students are welcome to present to us anytime. It doesn't have to be run through a committee. Yes. If you contact um, Jen, or if Jen's appointed and you contact her, or if you contact myself or Tina beforehand, any student can be put on the agenda. Um, really, any senator could let us know. But um, other than that, any student who attends could bring something up during the new business at the end of the agenda. So any students will, uh, any student is welcome to um, come to the Senate and present any issue that they would like to discuss. Thanks. The queue is open. All right. Seeing no further comments, we move to vote. Once again, the Rensselaer Union 45th Student Senate confirms the Grand Marshal's appointment of Jennifer Wilcox to the position of Student Government Communications Chair, effective immediately. So moved by Justin and seconded by Keegan. All those in favor? Okay. All opposed? Motion passes 1802. All right, that's going to conclude um, the majority of our agenda tonight, so we're going to move to committee reports. Arnie, Melanie. Okay, so we have an official meeting time. It's Tuesdays at 4. Um, and so we had our first meeting on Saturday, actually, though. Um, and so we're starting our projects. I assigned members to each project. Um, and just a reminder, the projects were electronic voting, um, a template procedure for referendum, and um, like sign policy for a referendum. So, um, and we have an open spot. For what? For Arnie. Like an open. <laughs> oh, um, I guess. It, it, it doesn't have a name. It used to be oh, IC, the, so like I don't know. What it's to call still it. spelled so out as IC, I so it can't IC, be filled right so now. So like it's yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What it's to just kind of floating there. <laughs> so I'm just calling it an open spot. <laughs> okay. Well, we need to figure that out. Um, 
We could, that could be done as amendment to the Senate bylaws. We'll talk about that after. Did you have something, Joe? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, moving on. Marcus, AAC. Uh, so, everybody is pretty familiar with what AAC is working on. Uh, recently, we've made some very big progress with the uh, <coughs> course syllabi. Course syllabus. I found out I've been saying that wrong for a very long time. It's kind of an awkward thing. Um, other than that, we're we'll working with the faculty senate. A like promotion, research, research, research. There we go. Keep your mind with the meeting time. Uh, Thursday, seven to eight p.m. Also, faculty senate curriculum committee opening is there. The approval process is talking to me. Contact Marcus if you want to get on the faculty senate curriculum committee. Okay. So thank you, uh, Michael FSC. Uh, so for SSC, we meet at 5 o'clock in the SGS on Tuesdays. Uh, Joe's committee, the Hospitality Services Advisory Committee, meets right after that at 6 o'clock in the same room. Um, this week we, or this past week, we uh, worked on a bunch of different things. Um, I'm meeting with Alex De Silva this Thursday to talk about, or delve into our projects a little bit more, but we're looking into gathering feedback, for example, parking. We're going to have to reevaluate our strategy for the uh, Arizona and Fathers, but we're still working on it. It's, it's going to be a lot harder than we expected. Um, yeah, uh, pet friendly housing, we're working on. I mean, we're working on a bunch of different projects. We should some help. We need a lot of help, so please come to my meeting. That's it. Thank you very much. Joe, H. Set. So we're taking Arizona and Fathers. That's my job now. Uh, we'll be meeting for our TPM, like Michael said, in the SGS. So we have basically a list of all student ideas that we've kind of grouped into some broader categories. That's, uh, that list has been sent to Matt Mueller to look over and kind of uh, help us gather some preliminary information and data. Uh, tomorrow what we'll be doing is kind of sorting out uh, which ideas we believe uh, have the strongest voice from the students and those projects that perhaps are uh, more relevant and need to be worked on sooner than, than perhaps some others. Uh, all that will be in preparation for our first official meeting with Hospitality Services this coming Thursday. So if you're ready to stop by at 2 and 6 if you would. Um, I just have a quick question. I know when you first presented uh, this committee, you had a list of like uh, what targeted areas for students you want to have on the committee, and I was just wondering if you've met all those or if there's certain ones you're still looking for. At this point, we still are missing a few demographics, but we do have uh, most of the demographics have been filled at this point. Uh, there's one or two, maybe even three spots that still technically need to be filled, uh, but at this point, we have a very uh, solid working committee. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, do you know which ones are missing? Just to get the news out there, I guess. Sure, uh, off the top of my head, of the ones that we still technically need to fill, uh, one athlete uh, and a member uh, from Residence Life, per se. Just, uh, I, could, what do you mean by member of Residence Life? Is this an RARD or is this a staff uh, member? Uh, could be either. Okay. That's something we need to touch Residence Life about. Anyone else have something for Joe? <coughs> okay, thank you. Lexi, SLC. Um, so SLC, it's a reminder, we have three subcommittees, Paul will go over the student policy. Um, for Res Life, um, we have been working on trying to recruit members for Residence Life and RSA. We have a couple members on RSA right now, but if any of you know people in Residence Life that would be interested in providing input for both updates to um, utilities as well as larger scale renovations, please let me or Case know. Um, the Student Health Center group, we worked on some ideas uh, to approach about the Health Center and Counseling Center, um, and Jess has been leading that group, so if you're interested in any of those, please contact her. Otherwise, I'll let Paul update you on the Student Policy Subcommittee. And our meetings are 6 to 7, Wednesdays in the SGS, as a reminder. All right, thank you. Paul, Student Policy. We talked and we planned and we discussed and had a really, really, really good time, except we still don't have the documents. So we did spend a substantial part of our meeting coming over with what sarcastic way I would have to say that. But um, we kind of, so far, we just planned out how we're going to advertise getting more membership to the committee. And we've 
reached, um, gotten in contact with the presidents of IFC and Panhel and the president of the student athletes something committee, the SAAC. Um, but so far, we haven't received any representatives from them at meetings. And we kind of will start advertising to the general student body and have that planned out. We just don't want to start doing it until we have the documents so people don't show up at the meeting, have nothing to do, and get kind of annoyed and just not come back. True. Wait, Paul, you want like a rep from IFC Panhill and Athletics? Yeah, because we kind of thought that they're the major, some of the major shareholder groups on campus who would potentially be affected by the changes, or would Oops. normally well, like no. <laughs> would normally like to have somebody at the table who's there when we're discussing stuff, so that they would be able to report back to you guys. You guys would be able to say what you want happening, just so you know we don't have a bunch of people mad at us because we didn't involve them in the process. Joshua, really, what documents? Sorry. The, the current up-to-date revisions to the student handbook of rights and responsibilities that Dean Smith said we would get like three weeks ago. It's um, specifically it's sexual misconduct and harassment. There's some big scale changes they're looking at due to a change in federal law. So The copy we have is currently the copy they were working on in July. So, yeah. so we have an idea of what changes they want to make. We just don't know exactly what the changes are because he hasn't given us a draft. So. Anyone else? All right, Gabe, what check? Yeah, so I'll be meeting with uh, <clears throat> Alex De Silva probably at the end of the week. I'm trying to coordinate something with the Indio Group, who is the original providers for our shuttle tracking devices. <laughs> so they keep the shuttles at a secure lot down at CDTA, so we're going to have to go after hours when they're finished running. Um, other than that, I sent a quote to Matt Mueller for a new screen in Sage Dining Hall and for an Ethernet run in Jasmine. So the next time is pretty slow, so it might take some time, but uh, we'll see. But that's everything. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, CRC. I guess for CRC, the major project that we're currently working on is uh, creating a social media site, primarily through Facebook and Twitter. To, um, that's more focused on college-based interaction with Troy. We're going to be working with Sage on this, and it's basically just bridging the gap between all the businesses and the people of Troy and RPI students and really getting to have everyone know what's happening on a weekly basis. We have that planned out. I'll get you guys all like an image of the template we're going to be using for that. And uh, we meet on Thursdays right now in the SGS from 5 to 6 until all the committee members, um, we can finally agree on a time that best benefits all of us because it's a weird schedule. So, yeah. You have a website update. All right, so last Friday, I held the first website focus group for a student government combined website looking at all the different branches, and that went pretty well. So, what I think I'm probably going to do from here is it's going to be a <coughs> every other week, and each focus group is going to have a different topic. Um, so, like, you'll know ahead of time, I'll announce it, and the topic may be um, something like design or it would be Senate. So, we'll be looking at the Senate component of the website. Um, we'll be looking at maybe the interface with Facebook on the website. So each one will have a different functionality, and the goal of the committee is to come up with a plan for it, not necessarily the coding for it, and then at the end of the committee we'll be able to turn it over and it can get coded to do it. So we're not looking into the technical aspect of it right now, more the content basis, what we want it to do, and what um, needs to be housed on it. Um, I know you said you're not looking into the technical side of it. Have you um, considered um, speaking to WebTech? Because uh, I know that myself and a couple of the other members are interested in helping out with the technical side. Yeah, it's down the road. It's not like we're going to ignore it. It's just at this stage we want to figure out the content first, and then we're going to get to the technical. So like, eventually we have to get there. We're just not there yet. Um, it's my understanding that the technical side of this is already taken care of by the United office. I only know that because I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> well, this is separate. This isn't the union. So I'm going to shut up. I'm just typing. <laughs> 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 Yes, the executive board and the union sysadmins are looking at updates to the union website. This is a website for student government specifically. 
good one that clarification. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's a common um, misconception, though. We actually talked about that because we're just adding how it's going to interface with it, whether it will follow the same new template or not. So I have talked to Molly about it a lot. Um, so that's in the conversation. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right, would either of the chairs like to give an update as to their opening plans? No? Okay, then we're going to move on to constituent reports. Uh, Shoshana, e-board. Um, so just for the new senators, um, a little recap of what UAR does. It's the union annual report. So every year, um, clubs and <coughs> union organizations propose budgets. They go to the executive board and get reviewed. Um, and then we kind of balance out the expense and the income and come up with your activity fee. Um, that is then summarized in a very long and very detailed document called the UAR. Um, that goes to this body, which then approves it. Um, and if it's approved, then it goes on to the cabinet of the institute and the board of trustees um, for a final review. Um, it's, a, it's a very important document, although students don't typically read it cover to cover. So other things that the committee is looking at is how to make it more interactive, such as making um, little infographics to explain the information in easy, digestible bits, as well as upgrading the union website, uh, the UAR website, so that students who want the information um, very specific to their club can look, find what they need, um, and then be done. Okay, so for my executive board report, um, men's soccer club was approved for budget for some of the equipment they need, um, particularly their soccer balls. Um, other than that, we had a report from hospitality services about the work that they were doing in the union. Um, you'll notice that uh, the number of food concepts was reduced, um, but hopefully you found that the quality has significantly increased. Specifically, in the meal room, we now have Thunder Mountain Curry, Max Deli, Salad of Hex, and Sandella. They were supposed to implement one of those like Moe's kind of Pepsi towers um, in the center console. Um, because of some electrical wiring that wasn't feasible, so it's getting moved down to the Rascaler. The only reason it hasn't been installed yet is because we're working <laughs> the latest version. So expect some really high-tech soda down in the Rascaler, um, at least at the, the latest by the end of winter break. Uh, additionally, if you go to Father's, please enjoy the new sushi, hot rice, and noodle bowls. They're awesome. I've already tried them, and I hope you have too. Um, if the demand continues, they'll do rotating rice bowls so that the varieties of rice bowls changes. Um, they also have for real smoothies installed, and there's going to be extra coffee. The dessert case is still under the works. They're working on getting the <coughs> specific items they're going to sell for that. And then lastly, with the Rascaler, Fire and Spice was replaced by Cusados. It's a really big, giant pizza. If you feel like eating something really filling late at night, they're your perfect bet. Um, and then also we have Mega Burger. Um, for people with dietary restrictions, there's gluten-free buns and lettuce wraps. So if you don't see it on the menu, ask them specifically. They'll give it to you. They're also going to have grilled cheese sandwiches um, starting next semester. And lastly, I did bring up Arizona. Sodexo said they've gotten numerous complaints. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> what they specifically want to know is our students complaining about Arizona because they wanted the specific brand. They can't guarantee any brand because they go by the, the cheapest price and what's available from their vendors. Or is it specifically the price point? If it's the price point, um, we as a Senate should help them by gathering some data from students regarding what kind of price they're willing to spend for different products so that they can try to negotiate those down and provide us with the best products they can. Yes, Paul. Um, I believe that James, if he were here, would refer to it's that specific brand and get just it's there, so just, just get them. Okay, that's more difficult, but I'll refer to you. Have yeah, I was going to say it's, it's the brand. We'll, we'll work on it with you, then. When James mistakenly announced that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about this you one. Should have, you should have seen the room. Like there was like a standing ovation. <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty confident that. Right. So point being, try to get some survey data if it's brand or cost. That'll really help them. Just as a reference, currently in the in Fathers, there is iced tea, <laughs> and it's like the brisk iced teas, which are about the same size, and it look like Arizona, and if it was just the price or whatever, people probably would be upset because those are there, but they aren't Arizona. <laughs> All right, thanks, Josh. Uh, any grad council update? Of course there is. Uh, <laughs> 
October 8th, Chris and I are meeting with uh, Ryan Goodwin to discuss the details of Wine Cheese Night and figure out what's going to happen still, but how that's how it's going to work out. And we're still waiting for the Two big things. All right, thank you very much. Uh, James is not here for IFC, but we have IFC PR in the room. Do you have an update, Jacob? Uh, yeah, last week was a pretty slow news week, so pretty much nothing happened. But Green Week's coming up, that's exciting. So be on the lookout. All right, thank you. Morgan Penn out. All right, same thing. Green Week is still happening. Um, and then there's also a blood drive tomorrow from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So if you can donate blood, you should go to the meal percentage. In between. Melanie? Does um, have applications? Or do or I'll probably find out okay. tonight at 10 now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got the yesterday. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Morgan. So for my report, um, reunion and homecoming is this weekend, October 9th through 12th. Um, so those of you who have been here for a few years, you already know what it's like. It's a lot of fun. There will be events all over campus. Um, for the freshmen, I encourage you to check something out. Um, it's really a great time. One of them, they're they're going to have a live stream conversation with Reed Wiseman speaking from the International Space Station in MPEG. So that's pretty cool. It'll be like a video stream, so you might get to follow them on a spacewalk or something. So that's going to be Friday, 3 p.m. in MPEG. I encourage you guys to check it out. Um, and then next, we are working on a Senate survey as usual. Um, as the cabinet members know, all survey questions are due cab this Wednesday at 7 p.m. for cabinet. We're going to review them and finalize the data. So senators and anyone else in the room, if you have anything that you feel should get on the survey, talk to any of the committee chairs or, or to Tina and myself, and we'll discuss it in cabinet. Finally, next week is Columbus Day. This was a long meeting this week. Unless anyone feels we have a pressing reason, we are not going to meet next week. <laughs> anyone have anything? Uh, Arizona. Jacob. Oh, yeah. I forgot one thing for the Mike report. Uh, Dean Hunt is actually leaving on October 8th, which is a big frowny face. So if anyone wants to say goodbye or something, he's a pretty cool guy. And yeah. But yeah, once again, good job tonight, guys. There will be no meeting next week. Get us your survey questions by get us your survey questions by Wednesday so we can finalize and have a nice weekend. Meeting adjourned.